Hello, everyone. Welcome to Ron Spomer Outdoors Podcast. We have a lot to cover today based on the stack of papers in front of me. It doesn't look like much probably, but a lot of words on here. How do we want to tackle this? I think we have some corrections, but oh, this one, this one is from a patron and we always address our patrons. I wrote this gentleman back right away when I saw his question, but I thought it was worth sharing. This gentleman from Patreon said, hey, I'm new to this Patreon thing, so please bear with me. No problem. My question is about shooting whitetails with a 243 Winchester. This gets asked a lot. I began hunting when I was 14, and I'm now 44. I have only had two deer that I didn't recover. My first was when I was 14, and the other one was two years ago. My father and great-grandfather always preached, forget about the heart and lungs and go for neck shots. I've heard you in the past talk about the neck spine shots and disrupting the central nervous system. Two years ago, when I lost my second deer, I had taken a 30-yard neck shot with a 243, 95-grain soft point bullet. In the past, I've always used a 30 out 6 with nothing smaller than 150-grain. <laughs> now we're getting to it. So that always dropped them, but with the 243, the deer ran and there was very little blood. At first, I blamed the ammo. But last year, my wife got a shot at about the same distance shooting a 95-grain ballistic silver tip. Exact same thing happened as with mine the year before. Now I was thinking maybe it's the ammo, but the caliber might be more important. I dropped from a 30 out 6 to a 243 due to recoil on a bad shoulder. If I'm going to continue these neck shots, which have proven themselves time and time again, should I move up to a bigger but still light recoiling caliber? Is the 243 just not big enough for neck shots? I still haven't jumped on the Creedmoor wagon yet. I work in a local gun shop. I've had a couple of 6.5s come in used. Once was your beloved Mossberg Patriot, and I love the fact that you're a professional hunter and promote budget guns. <laughs> you got to be realistic here. A lot of us get started with budget guns and finish with budget guns, and if they work, there's nothing wrong with them. The other was a uh, Thompson Center Compass 2, and at $250 each, what I paid for them, I couldn't pass them up. I've heard tons of horror stories of people shooting whitetails with a 6.5 Creedmoor and losing deer. Most blame poor bullet performance, but from what I've seen, it's more likely to be poor bullet selection. I'm not afraid of shooting more expensive premium ammo. I love Federal Vital Shock. If I'm going to continue neck shots, do you think the 6.5 Creedmoor is better suited than the 243 Winchester? Or do you think both cases were just flukes and the 243 is plenty good enough? Thank you for your time and knowledge. I'll hope to hear from you soon. Well, he did. I wrote him right back. He said, hey, you're analyzing all this pretty well, but I'm not convinced you've arrived at the ideal solution. Honestly, I think neck shots are the problem. When executed perfectly, they are deadly, but a fringe hit stuns the animal and it recovers. I've seen it, done it. Done it on pronghorn, mule deer, whitetail, and elk. Watched a guy hit a zebra in the neck with a 243 Winchester shooting a puny 55 grain varmint bullet. Killed that zebra deader than a rock. I once smacked a mule deer in the neck with 150 grain from a 270 Weatherby Magnum, and an hour later it was literally breeding a doe. None the worse for wear. The point is, a neck hit close to the spine can knock the animal out or down, but after the stun, it can recover and run off with little more than a flesh wound. There are few or no vital organs and tissues in the neck except for the artery and the spine. So you could tear out the esophagus and the animal it will eventually starve, I guess. But So the bigger, heavier, and harder hitting a bullet you use for a neck shot, the greater your odds of recovering stunned game. With a precise hit, a 22 long rifle will suffice. I do not believe you'll see significant differences between the 243 Winchester and the 6.5 Creedmoor. A step up from 30 out 6 might be a 338 Federal or a 358 Winchester, 35 Whalen, or anything larger. Now you're going to get more recoil. If you want to stick with lower recoil, I'd recommend a solid chest shot with frangible bullet. Frangibles have long been frowned upon, but every deer I've hit in the chest with a 243 varmint bullet expired quickly. The heart lungs destroyed. I like I'm the, like a prairie dog. Often no blood trail. Sometimes they run until the blood pressure drops, but it seems to drop quite quickly. 
The other option is a controlled expansion bullet for pass-through or near pass-through performance to leave a better blood trail. I have done well with Barnes TSX and TTSX in my 6mm Remington on whitetails, but sometimes they'll go 100 yards before expiring. There are no guarantees. Part of being a solid hunter is tracking wounded game. I make no guarantees on any of this stuff, sir. Those have just been my experience. Good luck. <laughs> so let me know what you think of my advice on that one. But that really has been my experience. I mean, so many people will tell me they'd love neck shots because it's just lights out right there. But I have seen them, as I mentioned in there, even with a 150 grain bullet from a 270 Weatherby Magnum, that thing is smoking. And shoot this mule deer in the neck, it clumps right over like I got him. And I walked up there, bent over to get my pack off and take my camera out to get a picture of my trophy. And he's up and running off behind a cedar tree. And he literally, I tracked him in the snow up and over a ridge and valley and another one. And when I finally caught up with him, saw him going through the trees, when he emerged, he was literally mounting a doe. And you could see the mark on his neck, the bloody spot right there. I had missed the spine, just hit some meat, and he was fine. I let him go because I figured <laughs> that guy deserved it, man. <laughs> he earned his breeding season. Uh, and you see that a lot. It's just too easy to miss that little spine going down the neck if you're a little bit high or a little bit low. So I don't know. I just frown upon it. I understand uh, other people just absolutely dote on it. If you do take that neck shot, I do think you will get an advantage from a heavier bullet with increased velocity. Uh, the higher you go in your bullet diameters and your weights and your velocities, all those things add more energy to the equation. And that's going to do more damage. Um, you're going to get close to the spine. I think with a bigger bullet, with carrying more energy, it is probably going to be more effective at keeping that animal down. And of course, if you hit the spine, it's paralyzed and or dead immediately. So uh, those are the trade-offs. But the reason that so many experienced hunters say, just go for that chest shot, is because the vital zone is so big there. You've got a good 10 inches, sometimes 12. You've got the heart. You've got the lungs. If you shoot a little bit high, you can still hit the spine. Uh, you break a shoulder so they can't run. Just, just a lot to recommend that. And it's the last part of the animal to move. You know, if a deer is feeding, you know how they do. They, they got their head down feeding very calmly, and you line up your neck shot, and they suddenly snap their head up to look around. There went your shot, whereas their chest is still there. You know, they can move their head all over and their neck and look around when they're alerted or spooked or something, and the chest is there until they finally run off. And that, the bow hunters will tell you, they're ducking the string. You know, that's when they make that initial lunge. They had kind of duck down to get the spring in their muscles of their legs, and then they launch. But your bullet's going to land in that chest cavity. <laughs> A lot better chance for that one. That's why we like those chest shots. Okay, now let's see what else we have here. Probably some corrections. It looks like the, the team has given me a couple of corrections. This is someone called Jerry, and he's responding to something I did on my main channel on flattest shooting cartridges. Oh, that was the flattest shooting cartridges by caliber. Okay. Hey, something is missing here. I've shot many a rifle in my day, but nearly all of them have the same bullet drop at 300, 400, 500, and even 600 yards. With a 200 yard zero, 300 yards is 307 inches, 400 yards, 14 inches, 500 yards, 35 inches, 600 yards, 72 inches. So what am I missing here? Every rifle and even bullet powder load, it's just like, it's almost the same regarding bullet drop. So where does this flat shooting come into play? Oh, <laughs> wow. Well, I don't know exactly where you're getting your data, but what I did in this test was to shoot dead level. So I have my barrel pointing dead level to the ground, we shall say, not angled up as virtually every rifle is. The only way you can get a bullet on the target downrange is by angling the muzzle up a little bit to throw the bullet up because gravity immediately begins to pull it down. So even at 100 yards with a fast, flat shooting cartridge, you would drop under your actual aim point. Won't amount to much, maybe a half inch or an inch or something, but still, it's dropping all the time. So the further you go out, the more they drop. So th those are the measurements I started with. I took a dead level barrel. I did not crank it up to shoot two inches high at 100 or anything like that. And then I just used a ballistic calculator to figure out how much drop I was getting at these different distances. 
and they are significant. I mean, you get a 30-30 and you're not coming anywhere close. Now, you are correct in that the 243, the 270, 30 at 6, 7 rem mag, pretty much all of those bottlenecked cartridges in that category come pretty darn close. If you set them up for maximum point blank range, say no higher than three inches, uh, that usually happens at around 150 yards. And then out there at 300 yards, they're all falling within about an inch or two at the most of one another. But you throw something like a 4570 in there, huge difference. 30-30, um, significant difference. Anything with a low BC bullet, a bullet that is not aerodynamically efficient, that's where you really start to get the drops. But it it all adds up. One really interesting thing that too few people, I think, realize is that you can have a narrow caliber like a 243, 24 caliber bullet, and you can have a 30 caliber bullet. And the 30 caliber bullet could weigh 180 grains, and the 24 could be 108, 115 grains, a lot lighter. If you launch those both those bullets at the same muzzle velocity and they both have the same ballistics coefficient rating which is a product of their diameter, their mass or density, and their form factor. If the BC on those comes out exactly the same and the muzzle velocity is exactly the same, the trajectory will be exactly the same. They will both fall the same. Uh, the only difference will be the heavier bullet will carry more energy at all distances. Uh, they'll also be drift, drifting in the wind the same because the BCs are the same and the muzzle velocities are the same. So it doesn't really matter that one's heavier than the other one. Now, most of us grow up th hearing and thinking that if you want to resist uh, the wind or buck the wind, as we say, you get a heavier bullet. Not necessarily true. It has to be a higher BC bullet too. Heavy helps get your BC up there. But if you got a poor form factor, like a round nose or a flat nose, hmm, <laughs> bets are off. So that's what's going on there, Jerry. I suggest that you get a, a good ballistic calculator. Don't just don't just assume that these little charts that you see a lot of times in advertisements and catalogs and things are dead on accurate. Those are kind of a general. Uh, if you get the actual muzzle velocity and the BC of your bullet and enter all that stuff into a ballistics calculator, you will see the differences in the drops because they do amount to quite a bit out there past 300 yards. Out to 300, yeah, it's not a heck of a lot of difference. Good point though, Jerry. You're you're paying attention and, and noticing some important things. Okay. Now this one, I'm not sure if I can figure this out. Mark, on one of my podcasts, I was talking about factory bullets and wrong sizes. Great listening again, Ron. Just a point, you can't take 30 inches off when you start with a 24-inch barrel. I'm sure you meant 30 feet per second. I'm not exactly sure what Mark is referencing here, but I must have been talking about cutting off barrel length and then getting a slower velocity as a result. And what happens is you get 30 feet per second on average, every inch of barrel you take off. So if you go 24 inch barrel, you go down 22, you're going to lose 30 feet per second per inch. So you've lost 60 feet per second. I must have misspoken and said 30 inches instead of 30 feet per second, which is something I often do. I get to spouting off all these numbers and feet per seconds and foot pounds of energy and everything else, and I'll get something messed up. So, well, just the other day, I was doing something on calibers and cartridges and whatnot, and I was talking about a six millimeter and a six five millimeter and a seven millimeter and a 30 millimeter and a, th oops, <laughs> came out 30 millimeter. That's going to be one big bullet right there, folks. All right. Thanks, Mark. Uh, this one is Gus. Another one in reference to a podcast, Ron, uh, usually you have good answers, thoughts and insights, usually <laughs> about hunting and shooting, but me thinks you have been out west a long time using scoped rifles and you're not used to the states and counties where shotguns were, or still are, the only firearm allowed to hunt deer. There's a reason it's called buckshot. It's to shoot buck deer. <laughs> it will and has killed deer. Um, in, including bad two-legged critters, and it also stops riots really quick. I, I don't know if I've heard about anybody shooting buckshot to stop a riot recently. I think you've been watching too many Westerns, <laughs> but it sure was a standard on all the old Westerns. 
So he's saying essentially buckshot will and has killed deer, bad critters. It is a perfect no, but is it? It is meant for close in shooting in areas that have farms or towns nearby. Yes, that's true. A rifle bullet from a high velocity cartridge can travel six miles, which is not good with people and farm animals in the area. Um, Shotgun ammo projectiles don't travel as far. You're correct about the cone effect of a shotgun. That's the pattern opening up as it goes down range. Um, but there are several 33 caliber lead bullets going toward the deer, not just one. Well, if, depending on the buckshot size you've got, they go from size four buck, I think four, three, two, one, zero, double lot, triple lot. The biggest one's triple lot, and I'm pretty sure that's a 0.36 inch caliber, three, 36 inch ball. So you can figure your velocities, your ballistics, and your drops, and all the rest of them out of that ball size of each individual ball. But let's finish with his before I get into that. Um, most commercial ammo buckshot shotgun shells are loaded with double lot buck. Double lot buck is 33 caliber. I think that's right. Good point there, Gus. Uh, some ammo companies have loaded number four buck. That's the smallest one. Um, that's 24 caliber. Number three buck is 25. Number one buck is 30. Zero buck is 32. The 33 caliber, zero, zero buck. Yeah, triple buck, 36 caliber. I got it right. <laughs> okay. All right. So basically what Gus is saying is that I said that buckshot was not all that good for hunting deer. And I stand by that, despite what you're saying, Gus. And I heard from several other people about this. One guy even said he was getting dense patterns at a hundred yards with buckshot. And I just can't believe that. Now you are going to have enough energy in that 36 caliber ball from the triple odd buck to do some good penetration. If I remember right from a search I did though, the energy in that ball at a hundred yards was down to something like 400 foot pounds. I may be wrong on that. You might want to look it up, but it's not much. But still, that's a pretty heavy ball, and you're going to penetrate into the lungs of a deer, I imagine. The point is, as your pattern opens up downrange, how many of those balls actually penetrate or hit a vital area as opposed to a wounding shot? And that's why I'm thinking that sh shotgun slugs are not all that effective. Yes, inside of 50 yards, properly set up, they will be darn effective. And then I understand in heavy cover uh, traditional hunting in the southeast where they would actually use dogs to drive the deer out of the swamps and things. It's just, I guess, about impossible to hunt any other way in some places like that. Those slug shotguns can be very deadly, no doubt about it. But you do need to consider that these are individual pellets going downrange. So even though that entire load has a lot of energy, it gets dispersed across all those pellets. And when you get up to size triple lot buck, those 36 calibers, I think in a 12 gauge shell, you're lucky to get eight or nine of those in the load. So there's not a lot of pellets going down range. But I get your, your point, Gus. And uh, that is why a lot of states will specify you can only shoot with shotgun using the uh, buckshot rather than slugs even. Although I think most states will allow um, solid slugs too. The, the problem I have with the solid slugs in a shotgun though is the ricochet potential. I understand what the theory is about you're not having a bullet fly six miles and landing who knows where, but there are so many states that allow modern rifles that don't have a problem with people falling over in their uh, yards from bullets coming out of nowhere. You just rarely if ever hear about that. It's really, really rare. And you do hear about hunters in the woods getting ricochet hitting things. Um, and these big, heavy slugs really bounce, especially off of frozen ground. So something to think about. Whereas you get a little 243, 100-grain bullet or a 130-grain bullet from a 270, for instance, those can be pretty frangible, break up when they hit. There's such high velocity that they hit branches or things and they break up. And then that reduces the distance at which they can go. And my ultimate argument on this one is no one ought to be shooting up in the air with no backstop. So even though that bullet can fly six or seven miles, nobody should be out there shooting where the bullet, if it misses your deer or whatever you're shooting at, will fly into the sky to who knows where. You've got to have a safe background. That's kind of a basic of hunter training. So that's my position on that one. Okay, now let's get all oh, the quick ones that came in over the wires, shall we say. Patrick from Georgia. Ron, love the show. Thank you. 
I have learned so much from watching you. Well, good. Keep up the good work. I also love the 7mm bullets, just as you do. My question is, can you make a 7mm bullet in a straight wall cartridge? Ha! Huh. Where the walls are not parallel to each other, but slightly angled in towards each other, this would allow the back of the bullet to be a little fatter and hold more powder. No, that's not going to work. I'm thinking of those states that allow straight wall cartridges only. This could give them a truly long-range option compared to the bullets that are currently available. Maybe get a 150-grain bullet with a good BC from a 7 millimeter at 2,500 feet per second or so. 300 yards would be very viable and accurate, just food for thought. I like where you're thinking here, Patrick, but you don't quite have it right. Um, you can't change the taper of the bullet, really. you got to think a bullet is contacting the walls of the, the barrel, the bore, um, and it needs a shank. And it can't be, yeah, it, it could be a tiny bit of a shank, but this idea that you're going to taper it gradually from the base toward the nose uh, and then squeeze the, the mouth of the cartridge around it, the neck of the brass cartridge around it, is, is not going to work. You end up then with a sloppy throat because the bullet is not really close to the walls. It tapers in and then there's this gap in there and... Uh, I have never seen a cartridge designed like that. Um, but you could have a straight walled seven millimeter. It's just that it's only a 28 caliber, 0.284. And that's a pretty small bullet. And then you're having to push it with a very limited powder supply, unless you get a really long bullet. But it's just not really practical. Um, that's why you see most of your straight walled cartridges are throwing 35 uh, caliber and up because you need to get your bullet mass up to compensate for the lower velocities. You just cannot get velocities as high when you've got a full diameter bullet matching up with your powder column. It's, well, think of it, think of it as a muzzle loader. Back in the day when they had muzzle loaders, your powder column was the same diameter as your bullet or your bore. You, you just put the powder in and then you shove the ball on top of it. It's the same diameter. You didn't have a bottlenecked um, chamber in the back of that. So once they got brass cases to hold the powder, that changed things up. Then you breech loaded it. Now you can go with a wider chamber and a narrower bore. That's where the bottlenecks came in for more efficiency at driving the bullet faster. Um, so I get what you're driving at here, but it's not going to work with a seven millimeter. Um, and there's just really no way to do it. You can't, for instance, step down the bullet. Say you started with a bullet at um, 35 and then you necked it or you, you stepped it down to 7 millimeters. You're still going to have the 35 caliber width at the base of it. <laughs> so you went from, you've gone from a 28 caliber to a 35 with a hard step right there. There's your drag in the wind. You're still going to increase your drag and it's not going to be stable built like that either probably. So. Yeah, you're thinking, and that's cool. I appreciate that. It's, it's innovative. People who are willing to think outside of the box and come up with things that work. But I don't think we're quite there on that one, Patrick. Okay, let's see what uh, Lenar from uh, Georgia. Another Georgia. Why wow, you like that? Two Georgias in a row. Sometimes I wonder if my team isn't just picking these, cherry-picking these out to make these points. It's the Georgia day. Ron, the Coriolis effect. Oh, gosh, this is my nemesis, guys, the Coriolis effect. I still haven't figured this thing out. Let's see what this gentleman has to say. The Coriolis effect. If you take a bullet and drop it in a barn where there's no wind, it will move to the west. So that would be a pretty big barn and a pretty long drop, I'm thinking. So if your bullet is traveling 1,000 yards and it drops 20 feet to 23 feet, Get in a barn with no wind, get up that high, use the laser plumb bob to get your spot down below you. You'll see, use it, what? <laughs> you will see how far it moves. This was a college experiment we did. Well, you must have had a, yeah, okay. <laughs> That's interesting. This probably getting closer to understanding the Coriolis effect than I do. I'll tell you that, Leonor. Uh, oh, it's Leonard. There was a D on there I didn't see. Um. Yeah, I studied some more on this Coriolis effect. And there are so many sites that say, well, it's because the earth is spinning and your target is dropping away from your bullet's flight. And others say it's like being on a merry-go-round and it 
centrifugal force throws the bullet higher or I mean they go all over with it and that's why I keep repeating it and coming up there with the right answer the really scientific approaches that I've seen I still haven't figured out why it happens or how it happens but they all say that if you shoot north of the equator in any direction your bullet always Coriolis effect drifts or spins to the right and when I first heard that, I thought, okay, we're shooting north and your bullet's going right. But if you turn around and shoot south, then wouldn't it go left? I mean, it goes right for you, but it's changing its direction from east to west. And that had me confused. Apparently, it doesn't matter which direction you shoot. It always goes right. Why is now? I'm down to the why is this happening? I'm willing to accept that it always goes right. Some pilots out there have to have the answer to this because the Coriolis effect has to be mathematically computated or computed, computated, that's a cool word, <laughs> mathematically computed for launching missiles and probably artillery to get it to land right. When you really start to extend your distances, it really comes into play. So I would like to hear someone who was an artillery officer, for instance, or someone who flies and works with this kind of stuff. What is going on to make this Coriolis drift to the right business in the Northern Hemisphere and the opposite drift to the left in the Southern Hemisphere? What makes that happen? When I find a good answer, I am going to read it and celebrate and give you a gold star. <laughs> Send it in. Okay, this is Todd. He's asking about firearms. Hallelujah. No Coriolis this time. <laughs> Just firearms. I might come close to getting this one. I have a question about scope mounts. I bought a Winchester Model 70 Super Grade uh, at a small gun shop. Decided to buy a loophole 3-9 to nine by 40 millimeter scope from them to mount on my rifle. I usually mount my own scopes, but the shop said they would mount it and bore sight it for free. So I thought, why not? I had already purchased matching blued bases for the scope mount so that the shop has to do is put some matching rings on it. To my surprise, the person behind the counter said it's better to have a one-piece base for the Model 70. It's easier to adjust for eye relief. And I wanted to put a one-piece black mat Picatinny base on my Super Grade rifle. I told him, I think that might look okay if it was a synthetic stock or an AR, but I want to keep this rifle traditional. High luster bluing, grade A wood. Um, yeah. So these guys are supposedly good gunsmiths at this shop. I'm surprised that they acted like the two-piece bases would be a hassle or hard to get the correct eye relief. I told them I have several Winchester Model 70 featherweights with two-piece scope mounts and a 50-millimeter loophole scope mounted on them. No problems getting the proper eye relief. The young gunsmith said he will see what he can do, and he has my rifle for over a week. So I'm a bit concerned. What's your opinion on two-piece scope mount bases versus one-piece for the Model 70? This rifle is in 300 Win Mag. Thanks. I really enjoy your podcast and articles over the years. You go, okay. Appreciate that, Todd. Yeah, that strikes me as quite strange, too. Um, I've never had any issues getting good eye relief out of a two piece mount on my Winchesters. And well, gosh, I, <laughs> I've done plenty of them and pretty standard stuff. Um, now, sometimes you will find scopes that are really short, they just don't have a lot of space for the rings in front of the turrets between them and the bell and in the back between them and the power ring um, but boy these loophole three to nine by 40 i've mounted a lot of those and have never had any issues with them on my featherweights i think i had one on a 30-06 featherweight model 70 and i had two piece mounts i just don't see it um Maybe they had a whole bunch of one-piece mounts they wanted to sell. They're trying to get rid of them. I don't know. Something you might do is contact uh, Tally, Tally Rings and Bases and whatnot all, and just explain to them what's going on and ask their opinion. But I just don't see any reason for it. I personally don't like one-piece bases. They get in the way of loading the magazine, and sometimes uh, they'll even catch the empties when you're cycling and they'll slam against that and fall down back in there and get a jam out of the deal so i i like two pieces myself i generally use uh tally one piece which means the ring and the base are together uh you don't have to screw the ring onto the base and the base onto the rifle you just screw the base on and the ring is part of that base so it's all in one piece perfectly straight fewer screws to mess up break off or anything like that you might want to check those out i really like those so yeah that sounds kind of strange 
From Maine, Seth asks, can you tell me what's the difference on what is different about my Lou Horton Remington 700 BDL? Is it just that it was made in a long action, not too short? Boy, Seth, I don't know what a Lou Horton Remington 700 is. This must be a local thing. Maybe there's a, a gun shop called Lou Horton over there, um, and they can order special rifles branded for them from Remington or something like that. I know there are different uh, wholesalers and or gun shops that will have a very special model made with maybe a, a certain length of barrel that they don't normally have. Uh, or a different kind of stock or something like that. And that might be what you mean by Lou Horton, because I'm sorry, living out here in the West, I don't, I've never run into a Lou Horton. I'm thinking of, uh, what is it, up in Canada, they got the donut shops everywhere. That's some kind of a Horton, <laughs> Horton's Donuts, I think. <laughs> Those sound pretty good. So, yeah, I don't know exactly what it is. Uh, the different, what's different about your Lou Horton Model 700? I do not know. We're going to have to ask the rest of the audience here. Who knows anything about Lou Horton Remington 700 BDLs? I'll bet you somebody out there knows the answer. And maybe I'm just guessing it's a certain kind of a gun shop up there. So uh, let's see what we come up with. Right now, I'm drawing a blank. Now, from Virginia, we have Tom asking about... He's a farm family in the Appalachian Mountains of Virginia since the 1700s. That is a lot of history and tradition, Tom. <laughs> I like that. Now, there have been many family heirloom guns that have been passed down to different family members over the years, and they become lost. He puts that in quotations. I am wanting to purchase a new rifle, possibly a shotgun, and hopes to pass it down to my son once he comes old enough. He's only two now. <laughs> I want it to be a firearm that he grows up seeing his dad use, and then later on, down the road, he can do the same thing. I mainly hunt varmints, coyotes, foxes, and deer, and very seldom nuisance black bear. I'm having trouble deciding on the chambering. I don't want to buy too much of an oddball caliber, but something that will be easy to find ammo for years to come, not too heavy hitting for the youth shooters. I've been considering a 22 250 243 65 Creedmoor and 30 out 6. In the way of shotguns, I've considered 410s, 20 gauge over and unders. In other words, I want to get a do it all gun that he can grow up with on the farm. Thanks for your insight, Tom. Okay, Tom, I think I get your drift here. So, a rifle and a shotgun, good for just about all the things you mentioned, and uh, not too much recoil for the smaller shooters. And then also a shotgun. Let's start with the shotgun first. Skip the 410. They're a lot of fun. They always say it's an expert's gun. Well, yeah. I mean, they're an easy recoiling gun. They're easy to shoot, but they don't have much of a pattern. There's not a lot of pellets in those guys. 20 gauge is a much better option. And the ammunition is more abundant, more versatile, and, and it's less expensive, believe it or not. 410s are pretty pricey. Same with 28s. I love the 28 gauge, but the ammunition is more expensive. It's a volume thing. 12 gauge will be the probably the least expensive and then 20 gauge. 16 gauge, again, you're very few of them and it's expensive. A 12 gauge is the most versatile, but you do have the potential for more recoil. However, it's the weight of the rifle and the weight of the ejecta that determines recoil. And the standard 20 gauge load is about an ounce of shot. You can get ounce loads in 12 gauge. So if you have a six pound rifle or say a seven pound rifle, they're the same. One's a 20 gauge shooting an ounce of shot. One's a 12 gauge shooting an ounce of shot. It's going to be the same recoil. So if you find a nice lightweight over under in 12 gauge, it gives you the opportunity to someday use heavier loads, ounce and an eighth, ounce and a quarter, even bigger than that, especially if you have a three inch chamber for turkey hunting or something special, or you want to shoot slugs at deer and stuff. Um, so don't automatically think the 12 gauge is going to kick more than the 20. Think about the payload and the velocity. They're all about the same around 1300 feet per second or so. Um, and that's what's going to determine your recoil. So gun weight, ejecta weight, recoil is the same. You're going to get more versatility out of the 12 gauge. 
I love a 20 gauge. I do most of my upland bird hunting with that. But if someday you want to shoot slugs at bears or deer or something, you might want a 12. Although these days with these new slugs, they got the Sabo slugs and they really get the size down and the recoil down. The 20 gauge is a lot easier to handle. 12 gauge with a full size slug can be a handful. So I would go, golly, if you're not hunting waterfowl, I would go with the 20 gauge. Uh, quail, rough grouse pheasants, anything like that, 20 gauge is going to really do you well. They're, they're light, trim little guns. I like it for the trim feel too. 12 gauge is a little bit fatter everywhere in the fore end and stuff usually. So that might have an influence on a smaller frame shooter to start with too. Okay, now back to the rifle. 22 to 50, mm, I like it, but most folks are going to say, yeah, it's not legal in some states for deer. And it's not ideal for bears or deer. I found it to be quite effective on deer, and a lot of people have. But it does seem to make a little more sense to go with a bigger diameter bullet. 243, getting a little closer to reality. I know people who shoot elk with them and moose, and they can certainly do the job too. But again, a lot of people make that argument about having a larger diameter bullet. So the 6.5 Creedmoor is starting to sound like your winner here. 30-06. Excellent, but it's a little bit heavy on the recoil, especially for a new shooter. Now, if you're a hand loader, you can download it, no problem. You can also go with lighter weight bullets. That always reduces the recoil. Uh, plenty of ammunition out there, but generally, you look at a 30 out 6 factory ammunition, and they're going to start at 150 grains and go up to about 200. Most of them are going to be 150, 165, and 180. And that will do what you need for deer hunting, bear hunting and all. But it's a little much for coyotes and red fox, definitely too much. Um, especially if you're keeping the fur, which is the reason that I hunt that stuff. So I'm thinking that 6.5 Creedmoor for all the static that it gets from people, just because it's so popular, it's kind of become the trendy thing. So a lot of us like to hate it just for that. But really, you can't argue it because it essentially does what the old 6.5 by 55 Swedish cartridge of 1890, 92 or somewhere in there has done for a long, long time. It's just a beloved, effective cartridge, and it throws the same bullets as the Creedmoor to the same velocities, pretty much. So if that one's ideal, then why wouldn't the Creedmoor be? So don't get taken in by this anti-Creedmoor stuff just because it's a trendy cartridge. It really is quite effective. Not the flattest shooting thing in the world, but it's Darn efficient. It is twisted really fast, usually one and eight, one and seven and a half, which means it's going to stabilize the latest and greatest long, highly efficient bullets. So there's a lot to be said for that. You can shoot it with 120 grain bullets, even a little bit lighter than that. And that's uh, a little better for your varmints and stuff, your smaller animals. And then you can go up to the 143s, even uh, some of them, I think, are getting up to 147 grains, maybe even 150 grains now. And that will carry a little more punch at closer ranges for a bear and deer and stuff. So, yeah, you can't go wrong with that 6.5 Creedmoor. That's what I would vote for. All right, Tom, thanks for that. And good luck with your family heirloom guns there. I think you're going to have a lot of fun with your son hunting. Pennsylvania, someone called Mystic. This is a mystery. I recently, the Pennsylvania Game Commission pasted a law, well, passed a law, just a little misspelling there, to allow straight-walled cartridges in the special regulated area. I have always hunted with archery and or shotgun slugs. Doing some research on straight-walled cartridges, 357 Magnum, 44 Magnum, 350 Legend, 450 Bushmaster, and the new 360 Buckhammer from Remington. I'm trying to find a straight-walled cartridge for deer, bear, and elk. I'm not sure about the 4570 government straight-walled cartridge. Trying to find a good all-round straight wall. I don't like the idea of having to buy one rifle and one straight-walled cartridge. One for deer, one for bear, one for elk, etc., etc. Hmm. I know there's no perfect straight-walled cartridge. <laughs> it depends on the shooter, shot placement, rifle weather, blah, blah, blah. Any help would be appreciated. Mystic. Boy. Yeah. Trying to cover the waterfront here. <laughs> Look, the 357 Magnum and 44 Magnum, a lot of people love those for deer, but the 357, that's getting a pretty small bullet. Pretty small. You got to remember, those are pistol rounds, so you don't have a lot of power in there, and you can't get big, long, efficient bullets. 
They're going to be loaded with flat-nosed bullets, and they slow down really fastly because of drag. The 44 Magnum starts out with more energy, but really, you compare either one of those to a 243 Winchester, which a lot of people think is borderline for deer, <laughs> it produces a lot more energy than those two. So they will work. A lot of people love them, but I think you're going to have a lot more success with the 350 Legend. Again, you've got your 35 caliber bullet, but you're driving it a little bit faster, and it can be pointed. Um, they're coming in uh, bold action rifles and single shots usually. So pretty good little option there. The 450 Bushmaster is a little bit shorter, but a much heavier bullet. And that'll do pretty well. Um, I You're going to get more recoil out of it, obviously. And ammunition is going to cost you more. Big, heavy bullets, you know. But if you like the idea of a bigger hole, I would take that over the 350 Legend. I'd take the 350 Legend for a little flatter trajectory and a longer range performance. Now, the 360 Buckhammer is going to be almost identical in ballistics to the uh, 3030 Winchester. Everybody knows that the 3030 Winchester is a great deer and bear cartridge. Can be used for elk, has been used for elk. None of these are ideal for elk. Um, but the 350 Legend, 450 Bushmaster, 360 Buckhammer can certainly do it. Other ones to consider, and I don't know if these are legal where you are. 444, excuse me, the 444 Marlin can be a really good one if you can find it. Um, and the 375 Winchester could really be good, but oh, almost nobody chambers that anymore, if anybody. And ammunition is hard to find. Now, the 4570, that's staying around. Everybody has it. The problem with it is the factory loads are usually loaded down for the old, old trapdoor Springfield rifles, which are really weak. So you can't get much velocity out of them. Um, but then the modern guns like the um, Marlin lever action chambered in it, you can push that energy up quite a bit and get much better performance. And if you get something really strong like a Ruger single shot, the number one, that thing you can drive those really fast and get some incredible performance out of them for elk and moose and the biggest bears and everything else. So you want to look into the availability of rifles and then the ammo. You're going to have to buy some specialty ammo. Make sure you're getting the really high pressure stuff and or load it yourself which I would recommend. Once you're a hand loader, you can customize and tailor your ammunition to your guns and your needs beautifully. Don't often get that with factory loads because they have to please everybody with every kind of a gun. So you're right, there's no perfect straight-walled cartridge or, or gun uh, rifle to fit it, but uh, there are some good ones out there. So I would say, yeah, for your kind of general purpose, over-the-counter, let's go deer hunting and bear hunting, 350 Legend. Not ideal for elk, but it will work. 450 Bushmaster if you uh, can handle a little more recoil. And then, yeah, that 360 buck hammer, like I say, bigger, it's a 3030, only it's a straight wall, so you're going to be able to use it. And uh, the 3030 and the 350 Legend, they're kind of running neck and neck. I think the 350 Legend might do a little better down range, but yeah, worth looking into it. Study the ballistics and all of that stuff. You know, they're, they're not going to be huge differences, but it might, might be enough to sway you to one or the other. But right now, what I'm seeing in front of me, I'm going to go with 350 Legend or the 360 Buckhammer. Um, yeah, I might do the 4570 though, <laughs> but I would get it in a lever action probably. Lever action Marlin or a Henry would be super. I got one more left on here. Let's squeeze it in really quick. Virgil from Texas. Your video, the flattest shooting cartridges by caliber. Here we go with that again. <laughs> You show a list you created with performance specs on the rounds discussed in the video. In the video, you said we could find the charts on your website, but I can't find them. Uh-oh. Please let me know where they are on your site. Very informative. I hunt Whitetail in South Texas, and the hunting rifles I own are a 25 out 6 and a 257 Weatherby. That's like duplicating. Um, and a 300 WSM. I pretty much use only the 25 out 6 due to lack of recoil and generally being more comfortable with it. I get what you're driving at there. They all shoot pretty flat, flat enough to do the job. Shot placement is the most important thing. Excellent point. I shoot a, the 25 out 6 the best, and I'll bet that's because almost no recoil, right? Yeah. Also, with the Winchester Supreme Ballistic Silver Tips, 115 grain, that bullet usually fragments in the body cavity, creating uh, damage to the vitals. It looks like hamburger. <laughs> it's a great round for light-skinned game. Just my two cents. Thanks. Yeah, I pretty much agree with uh, what you found there, Virgil. 
So um, I'll check into that. Flatting Shooters Cartridges by Caliber and why it's not on my website. It should be in my blog section and should be titled Flattest Shooting Cartridges by Caliber with that list in there. Maybe it got bumped out or somebody removed it for some reason or something. I will check into that, get it back up. RonSpoomerOutdoors.com website. Write in a search for the flattest shooting cartridges by caliber, and we'll get that in there for you. Those are the questions for the day, folks. Went kind of long, but I hope you hung around and appreciated what we came up with. Thanks to everyone, especially our patrons. We always answer their questions first, and we really love working with those folks and especially appreciate their support, uh, moral support as well as financial. We really appreciate it. Uh, until next time, this is Ron Spomer. Keep sending in those corrections for when I get this stuff wrong because the whole idea is to provide good, useful information on Honest and Shoot Straight.